one of a series of events. This is one of a series of events that we're, we're uh, running uh, during uh, 2024 to celebrate the fact that it's 50 years since uh, the uh, coining of the phrase or the term information literacy. So you can see our logo, 50 years of information literacy, and um, we're, we're gonna be having a number of events, but this one um, has proved to be particularly po popular. I think the, the, the kind of, the, the, the key message for me, the key thing for me to take away is if you put AI in the title, then expect uh, well over a hundred people to want to come along. Um, but we're really excited to have a panel of speakers this afternoon um, or this lunchtime to uh, share some insights um, into some of the, the issues related to AI and information literacy specifically. So uh, if I could just have my um, first slide, please, Padma. Um, so just, I, I guess, you know, I just want to make a couple of introductory sort of points of thinking about um, AI. As I say, everybody is talking about AI Um whether you're um, in education, whether you work in, uh, you know, uh, uh, schools, universities, um, in the workplace, there's a, a real growing um, priority to understand AI tools and what they can do, what the benefits might be, um, and what the challenges might be. And I think many of us are increasingly aware, particularly those in education, that they're being used um, by students and they're being used by academics uh, for, for all sorts of reasons. We'll, we'll think a bit about some of the kind of the, the, the positive reasons why they might be using it, some of the more challenging kind of ethical considerations. Um, and I think when we think about information literacy, so when we're we're actually, you know, searching, evaluating, um, using information, then AI tools have got quite a number of potential um, applications so there's some of the sort of processes that we use routinely that that you may have already tried to experiment with seeing how you can shortcut some of those using AI um, if you're doing a literature search maybe getting a tool um, that, that summarizes research papers. And I know many people in the library community are starting to think about um, information literacy sessions where they're helping people use AI tools, um, but with a kind of a, a critical awareness of what they can and what they can't do. Um, I think if I could just have the next slide, please, Padma. Some of the kind of real concerns around um, information literacy re it really you know it really does kind of get to the core of this kind of whole thing around ethics and how we use information and i think many people have talked about ai not being uh, or many of the tools not being transparent about where the data that they're using um to whether you know when it's a sort of generative ai tool that's creating text what what is its data source what is it using and if that's not transparent what, what does that mean about things like um, issues of how we cite and acknowledge the work of other people, um, how we make sure that we're not infringing copyright, make sure we're not plagiarizing, a big concern. So essentially, um, you know, how we respect the kind of labor of, of other people people um which you know ai often is is not necessarily handling very well and i think one of the other kind of real issues when it's not transparent where the data is coming from um and people have talked about how ai can you know only be as good it can't generate completely new ideas what it's doing is taking existing data existing information and so it's potentially replicating biases um, existing power structures um, and causing kind of that that sort of echo chamber, that sort of filter bubble sort of type of issue that many of us in the information literacy world have talked about for some time when we we take this kind of uh, kind of very um, sort of slanted view of of the world. And also another huge concern that people have talked about is that the power of these tools to to create this this kind of seemingly new um, new information, whether it's an image, whether it's uh, it is actually just uh, misinformation. They can they can proliferate misinformation very very easily. 
Um, and so I think all of this points to the fact that information literacy, and some people have talked about this idea of AI literacy, but you know, information literacy is is actually at the core of of us being able to use AI in a way that is is responsible and critical and and ethical. And and actually, many of us, I think, in the library world, have got a lot to contribute to discussions about AI within our organisation. Um, so I'm really excited if I can just have the next slide to introduce our um, our panel. Um, we've got a really great range of people from different organisations who are going to talk to you in turn. Um, and um, I'm really looking forward to hearing from um, each of them. Uh, first up, we're going to have um, Joshua Rodder. He is a learning development librarian at the University of Nottingham. and um, we will then hear from Annalise Hardin, who is the strategic training lead at the House of Commons Library. And I was very fortunate yesterday to be at the House of Commons Library where they were launching a fantastic tool to teach MPs how to identify misinformation. Lots of discussions about AI. Um, we'll then hear from Rosie Jones, who's the director of student and library services at Teesside University and um, have a, a kind of more institutional perspective on, on um, how, how AI is being handled within her university. And then finally, um, Sarah Pavey, who's a freelance trainer and a school library consultant and has been doing a lot of work um, talking to schools, talking to school librarians about AI as well. So we're going to hear from them each in turn. Um, I think that's all from me. We'll return to my slides at the end because we're going to have a roundtable discussion after each of the um, the speakers have spoken. So you've each got five minutes. So I think first up, we're going to have uh, we're going to hear from um, from Josh. Um, so take it away, Josh. Thank you for joining us. Yep. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jane. I shall just share my screen uh, quickly so that everybody can see what I'm talking about. Hopefully that's visible to everyone. We're a we're a, a Teams institution, so my experience with Zoom sometimes varies. Um, but hopefully everybody can see uh, that. I'm also, if I can, going to see whether I can um, switch my camera off, uh, just so that it's not interfering with the bandwidth, as mentioned. Uh, so yeah, hopefully everybody can see the screen. Well, not in presenter view. So oh, that's it. There we go. There we go. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. I was going to say thanks, Josh. Yeah. Great. Excellent. Thanks, Jane. Uh, so, yeah. Um, so, yes, I'm Josh Rodder. Uh, as Jane said, I'm a learning development librarian at the University of Nottingham. Uh, I'm also a member of the ILG's New Professionals Group uh, and uh, one of the hosts of the Chatting Info Lit uh, podcast, which is an information literacy podcast for new library and information professionals. My main uh, connection to this topic is um, in the spring of last year, I was one of three people at Nottingham who were asked to uh, essentially put together the university's uh, student facing guidance and support on uh, artificial intelligence, which was back then it was just on chat GPT, but obviously it's moved on since and it's now looking at generative AI uh, more generally and that's developed into an asynchronous online resource which I'll talk a little bit about uh, at the very end of my slides, uh, but also a, a training session that we uh, uh, offer out to, to faculty at the university to book um, as well. So. Um, for my five minutes, when I was thinking of, of topics to talk about relating to AI, what I settled on was um, thinking about this idea of how AI, I guess disrupts is, is the, the trendy way of putting it, but how AI interacts with authorship and with authorship as kind of a central and crucial question within information literacy. Um, sort of, I come to librarianship and to AI from an arts and humanities perspective, very much more than a tech one. So um, I tend to get quite conceptual with this stuff. Um, so yes, I wanna say a little bit across the, the next couple of slides about this connection between AI and authorship and then through to information literacy. Uh, and to begin with, um, it's worth just sort of uh, cementing how fundamental and central the concept of authorship is to information literacy teaching, certainly within the university context. Um, the, the key questions really, when you're looking at a piece of information, uh, they are, who is the author? What is their background and expertise? What is their purpose and intention in creating the information? Uh, and from that, 
we are then able to infer uh, the, the, the things like the veracity and the reliability and the quality of the information that we're looking at, or it has an impact on things like um, bias. They inform the way that we read information. Uh, and those questions, I think, crucially are answered not only through the context of the author, but the content of the information itself. And just to give you sort of an example of this in practice, on the right hand side, that's a slide from one of the uh, critical evaluation sessions that we teach in, uh, in the library uh, at the University of Nottingham. So authorship then is, is, I think, central to information literacy. Who is the author? What are they doing? What do they want? Um, the question that kind of comes out of that, especially when we're thinking about AI, is what what do we mean when we talk about authorship? What is it that constitutes authorship? Is it just the, the content of the thing that we're reading? Is it the, the, the structure and the kind of design of a piece of information? Is argument authorship or a component of, of authorship? Thought, the sentient thought that goes into it. Word choice, is that a part of authorship? Word order, personality, culture. So I was, I was thinking about authorship and breaking it down into all of these component parts. And essentially what I was left with was three categories of thing. And this is where you can tell I'm not a scientist. Three categories of thing. Stuff that could entirely be given over by somebody doing the writing to the purview of an AI tool. Things that could be potentially reduced or homogenized or standardized if we as a, as a culture uh, over rely on generative AI to produce information, uh, and then things that remain for the time being reassuringly human. Um, to, to connect some of these up, content, for example, um, you can tell a, a, a chatbot or an AI tool to just, just grab a bunch of information off its training data or off the internet for a particular thing. So content, we can entirely surrender control of that to uh, AI. Structure, the way that writing is put together, sentence construction, argument construction to a certain extent, um, again, we can ask an AI tool to do that entirely for us. Argument is one of the things that, you know, we say criticality and reflection and all of those elements of argument are things that remain reassuringly human. But again, we can tell uh, uh, ChatGPT or one of the similar uh, tools, tell it to write an argument on a particular topic. It will produce an argument on that topic without, you know, really strenuous human intervention. Thought. Um, is kind of the saving grace in this in many ways. Um, I think we're, we're, despite what some people are kind of hyping up currently, we are many, 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 many years away from any kind of uh, artificial general intelligence. So thought itself remains with us, but word choice, that can entirely be surrendered to the discretion of ChatGPT or the system that we're using. Word order, sentence construction, how the writing itself is put together. In many ways, this is, what these tools are being sold as. They are things that can do that process of generating text and sort of take that uh, take that strenuous activity away from us. Um, personality, we would assume is reassuringly human, but um, if we get into a kind of a spiral or a cycle of, of AI generating content and that content being used to train AI and then AI generating more content, we've already seen that AI can homogenize text and homogenize content and exclude potentially marginal voices. Um, so the, the the personality within something that's been created can be gradually eroded the more that we rely on AI tools that are based on just an amalgamation of everything. Uh, and whilst culture, again, remains reassuringly human, that potentially has the, the, the risk of suffering the same fate. If we hand too much of this stuff over to AI, things get smoothed out, things get standardized, and we're sort of at the risk of being sort of fed back uh, similar tones and types uh, of information from these tools. So we've got all of these potential component parts of, of authorship. Those are the ones that I could think of. There are probably more, but already we can see that the traditional notion of what constitutes authorship and what an author is and what an author does, quite a large percentage of this is something that we are relinquishing control over or sacrificing control over if and when we use AI tools. And this, I think, going back to those information literacy questions, this, I think, then can have a uh, an impact on how we think about that key question of authorship within information literacy. Uh, because if this is one of the ways that we're teaching it, the answer's changed a little bit for something that's generated text. So who is the author? This author exists only in voice. 
What is their background and expertise? Their background is proprietary at best and completely hidden in a black box system at worst. Their expertise is legion, but flawed because they can hallucinate and uh, they are restricted by the quality and the quantity of their training data. What is their purpose and intention in creating the information? Their only purpose is to generate content. They're guided, but not governed by the prompter. And as generators of information in themselves, they know no intentionality. So all of this leads towards kind of this, this open-ending question that I'm just basically gonna throw out there and then um, stop sharing and hand over to the next person without even attempting an answer at this stage in the session. Um, do we need new information literacy questions that account for algorithm over authorship, account for prompts instead of writing, and that allow us to interrogate information in the face of what could be an actual, actual death of the author in written materials. And that's at the end of my five minutes, probably the very last thing I want to say is the resource that we created at Nottingham. Um, it's Creative Commons. It's open for anybody to access online. Um, if you're looking at sort of what other universities or what are in other institutions have done, please do have a look. Um, we've spent a bit of time on it and we updated as much as the, the rapid march of the technology allows us to update it. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Josh. Thank you. That was that was fantastic. That really um, was a great start to um, this lunchtime's discussion. So, and a, a great question to pose that we will pick up um, in the roundtable discussion um, shortly. But we're going to now um, hand over to our next speaker, so Annalise Hardin, who is from the House of Commons Library. So let's have the view from Parliament, Annalise. And just to say that, Josh, you're a really tough act <laughs> to follow um, because I'm, I'm going to have to um, apologise that this is not a presentation from me uh, per se. I would say it's more uh, musing and I'm not going to say necessarily going to um, answer the questions that I'm posing. Um, so it's a bit of a stream of consciousness. And uh, I thought in AI fashion, I would just say it's it's a hallucination uh, from me that you're guessing. Um, so I was really interested in joining this panel uh, because something that really struck me in my usage of artificial, artificial intelligence and especially generative artificial intelligence um, is how much my practice differs as um, a professional working in uh, the House of Commons Library and an information literacy professional uh, and my practice as a business student undertaking uh, an MBA uh, and, and not to uh, say poor me, poor me, but a, a very time poor and stressed student, which obviously has an effect on how I use artificial intelligence. But I'm sure you really all want to know uh, about artificial intelligence in the House of Commons Library. So I'm going to start with this. So you probably think that working in uh, the government sector we are, well, you probably would assume that we're really high, highly restricted in terms of information technologies and what we can and what we can't use. Um, so you're probably thinking, but, but you probably won't have much to say because they, they, they don't use it and it, it has to be banned. Um, it's not. So uh, we have some discretion and as the the... The line is from the Parliamentary Digital Service that as long as we use AI with personal credentials and we're not sharing any confidential or official data, uh, then we it, it is allowed. Um, so I'm sure you can imagine that it's, you know, something that we've been play, paying a lot of attention to like I'm sure all of you have. We have uh, a small group of colleagues in the House of Commons Library. One of them is on the course. I'm going to say hi Claire, I'll see you. Um, and we have convened a, a working group. We felt it was really important to position ourselves as 
a directorate um, and develop, so, develop some guidance for ourselves and our department. Um, and we, we took the stance that we, 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 we encourage, we support the use of generative AI because we want people to experiment. We want people to find out about it within the guidelines that we've put together. And these guys don't really read like information literacy. Uh, and, you know, anybody familiar with uh, the crap test will know we give advice such as, you know, checking the currency of your answer, checking the relevance of your answer and the accuracy. But then we bring in also some more nuance, like, um, as Josh said, checking about biases, check copyright, check the provenance of your images, uh, which is a point also we have not only the guidance, but we also have um, a policy on using artificially generated images. Um, we also go a bit further in this guidance. So we suggest how you can use AI in research work such as uh, narrowing down the field of research, aiding understanding, um, providing a sense check, or um, using uh, AI as a self-editing tool. And we also provide examples of research prompts. So I just wanted to show you that, you know, we, we think there is potential for us, but what's really important is that we need to do the work on educating ourselves. The next step that uh, we want to take for this is um, to build a bank of examples in, in a parliamentary context. So not just the good, I used general, I, I used ChatGPT and I got this and it was great, but also the, the bad, because um, sometimes it's, it's nice to know about things that go wrong. And we really hope to build this community of practice with other directorates in the House of Commons, and we're starting to see um, the start of this. But we've also been communicating with other parliaments around the world because we want to share this knowledge and guidance. Um, I'm sure you can appreciate that um, it's parliament is a very unique workplace, so it's hard to build a comparison. Um, and there's also an added element with AI, which is uh, the impact of artificially generated misinformation on democracy, especially this year, which will be a general election year. So for me, as a, a strategic training lead, it brings the question of how do we teach members of parliament about AI? What is relevant for them? Um, how do we go above and beyond to make them literate in that way? Um, so this is, this is AI for me as a professional and I think, so in theory, I should re be very, very good at using artificial intelligence in a critical way, um, because of everything I've just told you before. Uh, but I actually started using AI, uh, for my MBA and I was really surprised, uh, even as someone who would consider themselves really information literate, um, how easy it was to just throw everything out of the window and to rely on it quite a lot. Uh, as a business student, I use AI to do some complex calculations, to uh, summarize videos for me, summarize articles, checking my writing that is really useful. Um, also some negatives um, that showed to me that I had to apply some self-discipline and really rely on my information literacy skills. So to check some claims um, and to go beyond what um, hallucination I got. So again, here is a question and just a, a, a thought. It's, it's this cognitive dissonance for me that is really interesting. The advice that I and that we give as information literacy professional and then a personal practice. And um, I think this is what is going to be really interesting to convey as information literacy practitioners um, is 
this element of um, self-discipline and checking it with yourself as a user. Is this useful? Is this actually bringing any value to my work? Uh, which I think echoes back to Josh's comment on authorships and what you use AI for. So this has been me rambling for, for five minutes. Um, I'm sure I'll have some interesting things to contribute in the discussions after. And I'm going to pass on to the next speaker. Thank you. Thanks very much, Annalise. Thank you. And uh, I'm just going to uh, introduce our next speaker, um, uh, another information literacy group uh, member. It's fantastic to uh, uh, see you, Rosie. So Rosie Jones, who is Director of Student and Library Services at Teesside University, is going to be next up to speak to us um, about her perspective on AI. So Rosie, take it away. Uh, thanks so much, Jane. Um, uh, and thanks, Annelies, because I'm in the same space as you. This is probably a little bit of a, a rambling for me and a stream of consciousness, but um, uh, I, I, I'm hoping that it's still valuable uh, contribution to this discussion today. So I'm Rosie Jones. I'm the Director of Student Library Services. I lead a really large multidisciplinary uh, service um, at uh, Teesside University. So uh, whilst I am involved with the information literacy group, I kind of provide a bit of a strategic advisor role um, and I can't claim to be, uh, to be a practitioner anymore, although I have a team of practitioners that work with me. Um, and I'm on the university's working group for AI, so I'm very much part of the conversation, but I'm probably part of the conversation that's a little bit more broadly talking about this uh, rather than thinking about how we reapply this into practical uh, sessions. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm frantically taking notes as, as some of that is uh, discussed today as well. Um, when Jane talked about this session, I, I, she kind of asked us what are the key, key areas that we're really interested in. And I had two that I'm really uh, I suppose are really resonating with me and I'd really like to explore them further. So um, I'm thinking very much from a HE perspective today. Sorry to, to, to kind of put that uh, bias there. Um, and also it's really important for me to say I'm not an AI expert. Uh, I'm not sure anybody is, um, but I am really fascinated by this topic at the moment and what it means for my academic library in the future. So the first area that I really wanted to, um, I suppose, give you my stream of consciousness about, um, I'm not going to go into huge detail because I think we're probably going to explore this as a panel, um, but it was really around that boundaries piece of AI. Um, and, and to me, I feel like we're at a bit of a similar crossroads to, um, if, if everybody remembers, when the crossroads we were at when uh, digital capabilities became like this huge thing. Uh, within the sector and JISC started to do uh, really significant work on uh, digital skills and digital capabilities. Um, and I wrote about that a little bit at that time because I, I was lucky enough to be involved with, um, I suppose, some of the initiatives that are happening in, in that space. Um, and for me, um, AI presents a little bit of that same opportunity, that same digital opportunity and a chance for librarians to be front and central to something that's transformational. Uh, and that really excites me in the profession. So I'm often the first to put my hand up and get uh, overexcited about something that, you know, you could argue, is it us or is it not? Um, and I think that that's part of this debate today, which is to decide uh, if it's right for us to get as involved as we are and where are those professional boundaries for us? Um, uh, Libraries will be split on this like they were for digital capabilities. So some of us will be involved in shaping policies, the guidance, uh, making decisions, um, decisions on what we're even switching on within our organisations. Um, and, um, you know, that is something that my institution is, is it, we are involved with. Um, so my librarians need to respond to that. Uh, and we do need to reshape our training and embrace AI literacy, but there will be, and I've already spoken to people up and down the country who aren't part of the developments at the moment. They um, they might have a very specific role. They might be looking at um, policies or, or how we 
uh, dare I say it, police them, but they maybe don't think that this is our business. Um, my opinion, surprise, surprise, as you've already heard, you know, large converged service get excited about all the blurred boundaries at the edge of things. So I think AI is an opportunity and it's an opportunity to strength, strengthen our central and critical role uh, in an institution. And I'm always looking for ways to do that because I you know, genuinely think that our profession is amazing. Um, and I genuinely think that we we always come away with these like um, librarians have these transferable skills that we can reapply to anything. And that's the bit that that really excites me. So I think we could deliver on an, another element of literacy, AI literacy, whatever that actually really means. Uh, and I'm up for leading and in, in getting involved. But I'm sure that's going to be a further debate as we go through. Uh, the second area um, I'm also, I suppose, pondering at the moment, and it's really jarring with me slightly um which is uh, my concerns that ai might increase the digital divide and it it, it really worries me um and it, i suppose it worries me um quite a lot because of the institution i'm at at teesside university i lead on the university's access and participation plan uh, 84 percent of our students are app countable um, and I've seen firsthand the assumptions that are made around uh, digital, um, in particular when we were during COVID, the, the assumptions that were made around digital access and, and AI is concerning me in that space. Uh, so just to throw out a few things, uh, 22, 23, JISC were doing surveys in this space. And they found that over a quarter of higher education um, students had no suitable device. More than half struggled with Wi-Fi connection and a third were worried about mobile data costs. And as somebody that's already struggling with their bandwidth today, uh, uh, you know, AI is a big drain uh, on uh, students being uh, digitally equipped and having adequate uh, connections. Um, and uh, if we see AI literacy in any kind of comparison to information literacy, um, obviously there's a need for our students to be able to understand and engage with it fully. Uh, you know, if we say it in a lofty way to even participate in society. Um, and if there's a divide there or an inequality, that, that's really quite worrying. Uh, another of GIST reports um, indicates that students' main concerns with AI are fair access and usage. And that's particularly in relation to charges. Uh, and anyone who was at uh, Digifest last, last week for JISC, um, they, they were estimating that if a student were to su subscribe to a full suite of popular AI tools, it would cost them around a thousand pounds a year. And that assumes data connectivity. And I know, of course, we know that tools are free, um, but what if others are accessing the more powerful tools because they can afford it? Uh, there's just a there's an inequality to that piece for me. Um, the Higher Education Policy Institute have uncovered that 58 percent of students from the most privileged backgrounds use generative AI for assessments. Now, that's compared to 51 percent from the least privileged backgrounds. Uh, and maybe that figure isn't concerning enough yet, but we can already see the digital divide. So um, really my final comment, I'll, I'll follow Josh's uh, example from earlier. Uh, I suppose, does AI have the potential to widen an existing divide and exacerbate uh, factors that already inhibit inclusive learning experience? I'll, I'll end there, Jane. Thanks very much, Rosie. Thank you. Um, again, lots of really key issues there and yes i'm also very pleased to hear that you talked about the kind of digital divide digital po poverty issues i'm sure that's something that we want to um pick up on as well um but um before we get into further discussion i'd just like to introduce our final speaker um another information literacy group um committee member sarah pavey um sarah um is a school um uh, library consultant and is going to speak to us from um, the perspective of, of schools. Um, Sarah, can I yeah. see you there? Uh, well, I was I was turning off my video on in the interest of broad bandwidth, but I'm just going to share my slides now. So Excellent. I'm hoping. Thank you. 
Can you see that okay? Yes, we no, can. Okay. Yes, perfect. Thank okay. You. So one of the things I want to explore in this, I have to say, I am so excited about AI. I love it. And I've been using it for quite a long time, even before the latest sort of round of chat GPT, because I just think it's, for me personally, it reduces cognitive load. It gives me time to be creative. It gives me time to explore other things because I've got a robot writing all the sort of mundane stuff for me. And I don't, I don't really care about that. I think if you've, we've got a shortcut that allows us to be more creative, then why not? But in schools, this is causing a huge headache, particularly in England, I have to say, because educationists are really worried about it. They think that everybody's going to go out there and cheat. They think all the teachers are going to cheat and just write all their reports using AI. They are worried, and quite rightly so, I think, about the ethics and the bias associated with using a, a chatbot of some kind. Um, and they're also, obviously, as Rosie mentioned, the digital divide and the social bias that there might be in there, people with hidden agendas pushing their, their way of thinking. And also, they're extremely worried about redundancy, because if you've seen recently the fact that you can have someone that looks like a real person doing teaching and obviously in COVID a lot of people were teaching online so you know why can't you just have an AI bot teaching your lessons for you interestingly this is not new there was a, a, a somebody down in Brighton where they've actually I think it's at Brighton College they've been running a module that's totally driven by AI and they've been doing that for about 12-15 years so it's it's not new this idea but it's come to the fore and in education, one of the things we've heard from the other speakers is the need for people to understand how to use it properly in order to get the best benefit out of it. But one of the issues we've got is, apart from the fact that some of those AI tools have got a limit of 18 on them, so strictly speaking, you're not supposed to use them, but we also get this kind of attitude. So this is the advice from the Joint Council of Qualifications from 2024, and that is that we can put our head in a bucket because basically all the people are going to be going into an exam room. They're not going to be allowed anywhere near a computer and therefore AI is totally irrelevant. And when I actually went and talked to some of the exam boards like AQA um, and, and, R, and OCR and asked them about their attitude to it, they said it's none of our business because it doesn't affect our, the students in any way. They then said, oh, but there are some lesser mortals who are taking vocational examinations and they have to have um, some kind of coursework. And yes, we should be worried about them. So let's just ban it for them. And we'll have some advice, which basically says, if you get caught using it, you will get nil point. So that's their kind of attitude to it. Now, how does that help? somebody going on to the workplace or to higher education understand AI, it's going to drive it underground. And I think when we look back in history, this is one of the issues we've had with information literacy big time, is that because it's not addressed as a subject, it's not taken seriously, people go and find their own ways of doing things. And I think if we take this attitude, we're going to have exactly the same issues with AI. But let's just see if there's any hope on the horizon. This is the international baccalaureate's take. And they've said, I mean, I have to say there are very few schools in England, Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland doing the international baccalaureate, but it is quite prolific in other areas of the world. Now they say, no, 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 we've let the genie out of the bottle. So we've got to work with this and we can actually use it to enhance learning. Now, the great thing about this is, as Rosie mentioned, and I think somebody else mentioned in the questions that I saw in the chat, that maybe this is going to change the way in which we assess what people know. And rather than having a straightforward regurgitation behaviourist approach to just, you know, writing down answers in pen and paper in an exam room, maybe we are going to look at the process. And one of the elements of the International Baccalaureate is a paper which is called The Theory of Knowledge. And that is actually examining where information comes from. Now, 
Interestingly, the International Baccalaureate have said, well, tell you what, why don't we use AI to explain about the, the theory of knowledge? And they're actually putting up examples on their websites of how people can use AI generated images and use their cognitive skills, use their creative thinking, using their evaluation and analysis, a bit like we did with Kate Middleton's picture um, earlier this week. They can actually look at that and hone those skills into how we tell the difference about who's created this, the authorship, all of that side of it. Bravo to the International Baccalaureate, I say. And some countries have taken it even further. If we look at Australia, Australia said, well, actually, why don't we create a school friendly chat, which is going to encourage them to write the right kind of prompt. But it's also going to answer them back and start getting them to question why they've asked certain things. What is it they're going to delve into in their research and why did they choose that aspect and not something else? What is the relevance of it? I think this is going to be a complete game changer. Some people might say, yeah, well, it's a bit restrictive and it might have a hidden agenda, but it's a step on the ladder to what, as information professionals, we're trying to push in terms of our agenda to try and get them to understand more about information literacy. So whenever I'm doing training, I always say, you know, it's it's more than chat gpt open ai there are lots of other tools that you can use now the interesting one is that that new south wales school one it, where it's asking you questions is very like um a, a product called talk to pi pi.ai and pi never gives you answers but if you talk to it it says well that's a very interesting question why did you decide on that question and not this question and it gets you to think about it and to explain and i love that I like Claude because Claude is like chat GPT, but without the frilly language. And, you know, it's it, it, it's it's easy. The ones that are going to be the big ones are Gemini, which is Google's all singing, all dancing AI versus um, Copilot, which is the Microsoft version of that. You've got other ones like Consensus and Perplexity and Skype, which are going to be scientific ones. And then you've got ones, I don't know if anybody's played with Illicit, but Illicit's great because it analyzes academic papers. It sorts out which would be the most important academic papers on a particular topic, and it gives you prompts to investigate them further. Then we can do all sorts of things. My favourite is Canva. I love the Canva magic button because you can go and you can create artwork in any kind of style you like. However, what I have noticed is that it definitely um, does its images based on existing photographs on the Internet and just tweaks them into its own style. And then if you can't be bothered to do a PowerPoint presentation like I've done today, you can just shove everything, all your thoughts and ideas into something like Gamma. It produces a PowerPoint for you and then you can download it into real PowerPoint and tweak it. So my message is that how, well, question, how are we going to ensure that our young people, particularly in England and the, the British Isles, how are we going to ensure that they're going to be able to use AI responsibly if they don't get any practice and if it's just taken off the agenda? And the second one, that I think, is that I think personally, we're going to be having a sea change where we're going to change from being maybe the, what we would call the authors, the traditional authors of information, to being the editors. And that's where the wonderful human aspect of creativity and different ways in which we can use information are going to come to the fore. And to me, that's all part of information literacy. So I think maybe we're in the era of information literacy. And that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> OK, thank you very much, Sarah. Um, so four very different and unique perspectives we've got um, on AI. Um, if I could just have my slides up as well. I've got a couple of questions that I thought um, I'd like to sort of kick us off with. I know we've had quite a lot going on in the chat as well. I um I, I sense there's there's quite a lot of wariness and caution um about AI tools, some of the kind of real concerns that I, I also share as well around 
uh, the digital divide around issues to do with impact on um, the climate as well, the environment, my, mental factors of the the power that's needed to to to, to power AI. And actually, is that's very much on the front of my mind as somebody who experienced a power cut um, in the whole of the town where I live shortly before this event started. So I'm running on uh, mobile data and and battery power, and you know, very conscious. That, that you know all the things we take for granted when you've got no power you can't do um but a couple of um things and each of the speakers have spoken a little bit about how they've used um ai themselves but maybe some of them could elaborate a bit more i thought it'd be interesting to hear um a bit about how um they might have used those tools um and then and the second question that i thought we could address at this point is and you know is ai literacy if we're calling it a literacy is it different from information literacy or is it as, as somebody at a conference i was attending last week um shouted out who wasn't a librarian this is all about information literacy during the talk on 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 ai and uh the kind of what it meant to be human and a very uh, from Donna Lanco and Laurie Phipps, a very kind of sceptical view of, of, you know, when we should and shouldn't be using AI in higher education. Um, so uh, speakers, would anybody like to, to to sort of go first? Sarah's talked a bit about some of the tools she's been using, but would anyone like to say anything about their experience of using the tools personally, professionally, um, at, or address the second question about whether AI um, literacy is different to information literacy? I'm happy to. Um, yeah, because I've talked a little bit about what I use. Um, I think for me, it's mostly I, I, I don't use AI in uh, my professional life apart from, you know, the odd uh, experimentation. I think where I find it the most useful is as a student, and I'm sure that's what um, a lot of academic librarians are um interested in for me i use uh pop ai or popeye i have no idea that's probably what they were trying for popeye um to uh help me summarize long articles for example so you would have been in the situation when you're looking at a topic and you're thinking well what is what does this 45 pages long paper uh talk about and does it answer the question that I'm I'm trying to uh to look at so that's been really useful and I think um Sarah's mentioned Elisit as well that has a similar function um but I really wanted to echo as well what uh Rosie has been talking about um the limitations and the divide especially the monetary one where i thought wow i could just you know write all of my assignments if only i had a hundred pounds uh to spend across um a range of different tools um and to be honest i, I don't think i could live with myself if i did that um so that's probably the professional in me talking um but i think it, i'm really glad that, that you made the point about this rosie Thank you. Can I add as well, go, Jane? Go, please. Uh, yeah. so, so I didn't really talk about my use of AI and, and the place that I've loved using it the most so far is the bit where I do blur my professional and personal uh, boundaries. And that's in my playful learning work. Mm. Uh, uh, and the playful learning community recently had a uh, AI themed event. And, and it was so it was so interesting playing with the tools and, and being a bit more experimental. I mean, I think in its most basic form, AI has the most amazing role to play in um, quite interesting icebreakers and, you know, kind of activities like that. And and that's the way I've used it so far. So we've done all sorts of things with um, using Padlet to uh, draw or create photographs for us and had very fun icebreaker type moments uh, in that space. Uh, but we also used it a little bit more seriously at that event. Well, as serious as playful learning gets at times um, and used um, uh, chatbots and character generation uh, using AI. So um, chatting to historical figures was fascinating and fantastic and uh, exploring fictional characters through that and also um 
a number of people were using it, AI for um, ideation. So they were absolutely making sure the prompts were restrictive, but actually using AI like a critical friend to um, to pass ideas past and, and to be prompted with the right questions to make that idea fuller. So they were using it for lesson plans or PhD uh, planning and and that was really exciting. The other space I'm looking at, and, and it might uh, play, uh, uh, I think it was you, Anna, Annalise, that said uh, about, um, or was it you, Josh, actually, about the humanization bit? But the one area that I, uh, we're also looking at at Teesside is whether AI's got a potential to do some compassionate um, communication for us. Um, and that's, that's quite interesting, isn't it? Because we don't really humanize the AI, but actually, there is an element of uh, policies that you've got or um, knowledge bank type answers that aren't necessarily always written in the most warm or appealing way. And that, that's another way that we've been looking at AI. Thank you, Rosie. Um, Annalise, you, yeah, you put your hand up. Yeah, did you want to come in? Yeah, just had a thought. So I have got to, to do a disclaimer that this is really not something that I've used in my uh, personal and professional life, but uh, we've had some guidance not so long ago work about um, job applications and artificially generated uh, application letters mm -hmm. and CVs. And I thought, oh, we've not talked about this. I just wanted to mention that that is something that as a professional looking at recruiting and hiring, this is something that I've got to pay attention to. Yes, yes, I certainly know. Of many colleagues who've been um doing shortlisting um in the last sort of 12 months they're saying they're seeing this increasingly and it often being quite obvious that somebody has used a generative ai to write a supporting statement um, and that's information literacy as well as the ability to recognize it I yeah suppose. yeah yeah josh did you want to come back in here um i was thinking about your your sort of starting question as well about you know what what it means to be an author i know there's been a lot of people talking actually about you know that the ai and what what it might mean actually to be human and what we really value and you know and, yeah, and the... i think there was a very a, an early on uh, question i think that we had in the chat specifically around that um that issue so i'll just try I'll try and find that again but just go back to you if if we can yeah, the, I mean, there's a couple of things. I mean, to kind of link this to the, the the questions on the screen as well. I mean, I've used AI a bit a bit in teaching, and I think to build a little bit on what Rosie was saying, I think AI is at its best when it's a, a conversation partner and it's used for sort of self assessment purposes and revision purposes and and things kind of connected to that. And yeah, AI is at its best when it can ask questions and when it is capable of saying I don't know. There's nothing worse than an AI that tries to you know, keep answering questions even when it's running out of or seems to be running out of information. Um, in terms of the the authorship stuff, I think that I don't. So I've, I've used some AI things in teaching and I think JISC has got a really good sort of sandbox page of demos that can be really useful in giving students a hands on with some of these systems. In terms of like personal life and also non teaching related professional life, anytime I'm writing anything, I <laughs> I, I I feel like I would be the last person in the world to to do most of this because I'm well essentially I'm a control freak when it comes to my writing and I like to have sort of 100% uh, and the thing that Sarah was saying about um, less authorship and sort of moving into a future where we're all editors I like I really like the optimism of, of what Sarah was saying but I don't think I'd want to be an editor I think I think when I'm putting something mm. together it's and uh, it's less about sort of content and more kind of about a sacrifice of the process um mm. and whenever you're sort of writing whether it be a journal article or, or you know a, a presentation for, for something like this to me everything is a decision from the subject that you're talking about to sort of the, the subheadings and the examples down to the individual words they're all decisions that you make and each one of those tiny decisions contributes to intentionality and so it, it seems like a lot to give up and I realized that that comes from a position of communicative privilege um, in many ways and there are going to be people for whom this is you know an empowering tool um, but I think it's about writing as a process and writing as a human process and I, I do think there is a danger of 
ascribing AI a kind of anthropomorphic level of ability that it doesn't actually have when it's just sort of pattern recognition. Um, yeah, I think that was the point. It goes right back to a question uh, that was uh, asked by Siobhan, I think, uh, just just uh, really early on around, you know, when it's, it's, it doesn't understand mm. what it actually generates, um, the AI. So, you know, as you say, it's pattern um, rec repetition. And, you know, we've, we've got lots of comments about some of the kind of the, the ethical reasons why that's not necessarily a good idea. Um, I'm just having a look through because um, we've got loads of really, really interesting questions coming up. So um, I think we had a a, a question um, that I'd quite like to pick up on because it's been something um, that certainly at my institution, we have had to run lots of sessions for academic staff about um, assessment um, and, um, you know, the, the kind of impact um, that, that, you know, it might be having on the way that institutions are, are teaching, about what, how they're assessing, whether they are, um, and, and Sarah, you've certainly said this to me for many years, that many of the ways we assess students, particularly at school level, but, you know, even at university, is about a kind of out an output and we don't assess the process that they've gone through which is kind of where information literacy skills really come into their own where we have to actually you know do the research and kind of show our workings out and all of those kinds of things um so i i, I don't know is that is that something that concerns people um that we may get to a point where we just you know how how are we are, are, should we be completely rethinking how we sort of assess and judge people, whether they're applying for a job, whether they're for, you know, whether it's a formal assessment. I suppose my concern, Jane, is um, yes, we should be completely rethinking, but my concern from what I can see so far when you look at policies and um, I suppose institutional approaches that are coming through is people are treating this as a, um, how do we stop cheating in assessment and yeah. locking it down? And yeah. actually, what we're now doing is making assessment again. I'm a, I'm a bit on a, a you know a, a one trick pony the, a, a this conversation. But if we do that, our assessment stops being as inclusive as it could be. And mm. I just find that, that really concerning. That at moments, um, it seems to be how do we how do we ensure there is no cheating going on in this space? So let's lock it down and make it really old school and actually that's not going to be helpful to our learners so so that's that's my biggest concern I think we should be thinking really creatively in this space mm. Um, mm. Uh, instead uh, mm. but policies that you will you will see are locking it down yeah 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 okay Josh yeah yeah over to you yeah just to pick up on that, I think yeah, Rose is absolutely right that the immediate knee-jerk reaction has been a negative response based on academic integrity, whereas what we're kind of looking for is a more positive response that's focused on skills, whether it be the skills to use those AI tools as effectively as possible to kind of achieve the results that are wanted, or whether it's the soft skills, well, quote unquote, soft skills, the, the, the criticality and information literacy and all of its components and, and that, and sort of teaching that as kind of a, a positive, you can develop this and it will help you navigate the world of AI rather than the negative stop using it it's it's cheating etc it's it's we almost kind of as a sector got off on the wrong foot with this quite understandably and naturally so um mm -hmm. but it's it's kind of hoping that that pivot is going to happen towards yeah yeah certainly some of the early conversations i was having was all around what do you mean turn it in can't detect when they've used it you know and it's kind of well actually <laughs> it's fairly obvious usually when you read something but you know that the, the idea that turnitin could detect plagiarism you know is is a big misconception sarah sarah thanks Right, I'm um, muted. Um, yeah, I was going to say that, you know, I think that one of the issues, certainly from talking to the examples that, that in, at school level they've got, is, of course, there are huge number of students taking a huge number of exams and no longer have they got the workforce for actually marking that. And the problem is if you go towards coursework where you're going to be looking at process, 
uh, a thing, then they just haven't got the manpower. And it's a lot cheaper to get your AI bot to mark the exams for you. So I think there's a financial incentive there for not actually embracing this. But I think the IB get away with it, the International Baccalaureate, because they've got far fewer people actually taking those exams and they've got structure in there of teachers who do the assessment. Mm -hmm. Annalise, yeah? Yeah, just a practical point. So as a student uh, doing my second uh, MA, uh, sort of 10 years after the first one, I can really see the difference in uh, the assessment where at the moment it's more a uh, multiple choice questionnaire, for example, for, you know, 10% of the grade, for example, or a lot more writing about reflection on your practice supplemented by um, you know, informed by the literature on theories, for example. So it's a, and I can see how that makes it much harder to just put in an essay question in Chat GPT, for example, and get something out of it. So I've I've experienced that creativity yeah. around assessments. Um, we we could maybe move we move on and talk about some other questions. And I noticed that Ian um had put a a question into the chat which was whether we should be actively promoting some of the AI tools to students in our information literacy sessions so that they use them in an ethical um uh, uh, critical way and that it's something he shied away from doing so far has it has anybody I mean I, I think I think that that does seem to me to be the area that some people are moving into and that kind of speaks very much to my final question on the slides which is what role should we play um, in supporting and advising about the use of AI tools as librarians. Um, I don't know if anyone would like to to comment on, on that. Well, I think if we don't, then the students will just find the AI tools elsewhere and use them regardless. So I think there is an element of us um, exposing exactly um, the limitations of the AI, the, uh, the advantages of the AI, the how do you tell people you've used AI, all of those elements. So if if we're not if we're not embracing the tools in sessions, then we make it feel like this forbidden to topic and something that uh, students can't uh, use. Uh, I mean, I think the uh, there's all sorts of things that we we've not covered today on the ethics of AI, the environmental damage of AI. Uh, all of that needs. I sound like doom and gloom today, and I'm I'm a big advocate, by the way. It's just. I think it's our job in information literacy to almost expose that 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 um, wider picture of AI. Um, yeah, and the complexities. Um, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I just want to come to Josh because I think you might be able to speak to that about the role that we play because you obviously have developed this guidance, haven't you, at Nottingham? So I don't know if that's what you wanted to pick up on. And then, I'll, yeah, I'll go to Sarah, I, I, and then I'll go to Annalise. Sorry. <laughs> it's just a couple of things in terms of, yeah, I 100% agree that we should be teaching these things and exposing students to them. Uh, the, 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 there's a couple of big qualifiers to that, one of which Rosie has talked about already, which is the, the digital divide thing, which is if we're expecting students to use these tools, institutions need to pay for licenses for students to use them so that everybody can use them you know, uh, uh, to their full capacity, uh, but also because um, the, the subscription-based models, there's an inbuilt privacy element to them as well. If we're asking students to sign up for online services, that introduces a whole new area of complexity into the discussion as well, especially when those services, part of their job is harvesting training data um, for things. So yes, we, we absolutely should be teaching them, I think, but we need to do it in a, in a controlled way. And I think it needs to come at the cost of universities paying for everybody to have access. Um, I was also going to do a spiel on the ethical issues, but that could take us to the end of the session. So instead, I'm just going to <laughs> hand over to the others. Perhaps actually, that's what we need to run a follow up session on is the the, the, the kind of ethical issues um, specifically that, that an AI raises. Yes, yeah, Sarah, Sarah. Um, I was just going to say, I think, you know, again, in schools, there is a bit of an issue because it is so negative, the attitude towards it, 
that I think actually teaching them is going to be really difficult. We have a big enough struggle trying to get over the fact that information literacy is important. And unfortunately, in schools, whichever way we look at it, it is linked to assessment. And unless there's points for something, then they're not going to engage with it in any shape or form. And my, as I say, my concern, as I said before, is that it drives it underground and then it's going to set up issues when people arrive at higher education and in the workplace because they're going to say, yeah, but we've always done it this way. I found this out. I found that out. And you're going to have a really hard job then educating them to use it in a different way. Mm, mm, mm. So is... is um you know is this an opportunity though for us as information literacy um teachers practitioners is this because it it, it does strike me that b before people start sort of reinventing the wheel and coming up with some special critical ai literacy that we we you know we really have got an opportunity yeah annalise yeah and i think it's what we've always done i think um you know, there's a sense of we need to be brave. It is, it's difficult to have this conversation. It's also uh, a bit perilous, I suppose, during demonstrations. But I'm sure that in this virtual room, we've all done a demo of a Google search and it's gone horrendously wrong in front of <laughs> a group of users. Uh, we've done it. We've overcome this. So I think we're the best uh, at doing this. Um and I think Somebody it's said yesterday to me, "It's is this kind of like Wikipedia all over again, where we started off going, ah, you yeah. know, got to stop exactly. them. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to bring up the fact we've been talking about digital divide and I'm thinking about my users. So, uh, you know, in, in Parliament, we've got, I mean, we are getting younger MPs, but we've also got an older generation and we've got mm. also the House of Lords where we are we've got to demystify and change minds about AI because there's probably a reluctance and there's a lack of, of digital skills here. So it it is important for us to do this for, mm. for all of our users. Mm. Mm. Okay, we're we 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 haven't got a huge amount of time, but I would like to um, and we've had lots and lots of questions and comments coming in the chat and so I am struggling to keep um, a pace with it I don't know if Padma and Lewis have got any questions that they've that have jumped out to them that they think we ought to have a go at addressing as a, a panel that we've missed or um, whether at this point we just open this up to somebody if they want to actually pop their hand up and come on camera um, and ask us a question um, so we've got a little bit more time just for for um and and you know, there's, there's I think there's so much more we could say. Sarah, yes, I'll let yeah, you. Come I just in want to, to to add in about the digital divide and to say that you know there's been a lot of talk about licensing and everything else like this, but you know there's still an awful lot of free stuff out there and if what we're doing is we're we are teaching the principles of something then you know that to me is equipping them with the tools that they need to move forward and then yes if there is an access issue in terms of what what can be afforded by the institution I totally agree but at least we should be there seeding the basics what makes a good prompt what makes you know something ethical or not ethical how should we be framing our questions those sort of things are fundamental and shouldn't really I mean I've talked goodness knows how many um uh lessons on internet safety and things like that without actually having any access to the internet so you know i think we can do it and that's one of the great things about being information professionals we can use our creativity and knowledge to pass it on in different ways yeah i sorry i agree with you sarah that um I, 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 the skill is still the skill that we're teaching I, I suppose in some respects i also think we've got a responsibility to lobby though for that that equality across the piece um but i i agree with you i don't think it it, it matters if it's free or paid for the the skills that we're teaching should still be the same skills so there's a, a question from um karina that i've just spotted that was around whether it's a role for silip to be raising the issues about the lack of joined up thinking across the education sector um 
it's it's you know it, it, does anyone in education listen to Silip? I mean I think it's it's nice to think if we lobbied for this it would you know it might have a benefit but um I think that that you know certainly you know the information literacy group in Silip need to there's a a, a kind of AI hub I think isn't there on the Silip website with lots of resources on um but I think you know it is it is an area and and I think Jessica picked up the point that she had to uh, argue the case for the library to have a role in in uh, discussions about AI um, in her organisation. And I do think that, you know, certainly that can be a challenge, actually getting your voice heard, getting recognition that there's already a huge amount of expertise here. Um, and, and so advocating for that. Have, have, have some of you had to do that I mean Josh did you feel you you had to sort of be a strong voice and come in and say yes the library can contribute or were you invited to be part of that discussion we were invited but we were very glad that we were invited um and it's interesting thinking about the the joined uppedness of of it all because essentially what we saw at our institution was pockets of reaction really. So there are sort of people in computer sciences who are doing things around AI. There are people in um, the sort of research support researcher academy area that are doing things around AI. There are people in the education school. Uh, there's us in libraries. There's there's some sort of central, you know, kind of uh, uh, pro vice chancellor director of teaching kind of initiative type things. And it's it's what we've kind of ended up with for the time being is a bit of a Venn diagram. And so we're one part of a, a, a puzzle that's not necessarily a completed puzzle with all of the pieces joined to each other and I think the first year of AI has been what is our response going to be and what are our individual responses going to be I think ideally the second sort of post chat GPT year of AI for us should be okay how are we how are we addressing this collectively both within institutions and then you know wider across the sector um, so we were invited but but that was part of a patchwork um, and it would be nice to see more of a, a uh, an overall um, response and a consolidated response just to and I don't want to take up too much time but the other thing within um, higher education of course is different disciplines will have different reactions so people in computer sciences have talked to us and say we're using AI already you're talking to an AI right now um, whereas on the other hand we talk to academics in the law school and they say please keep AI a thousand miles away from us because all of our assignments rely on precedent and factual information so Having a joined up response, certainly within a university, so far has kind of encouraged vagueness um, in a lot of a lot of things. And I, I wonder whether that's sort of a wider issue beyond the sector as well in some ways, because mm -hmm. how you view this will vary depending on what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I know, well, there's, there's there's just still so much kind of um, chat going going on, so many um, questions and points. So if it, anyone wants yeah, to pick up yeah, on Jane, anything. The, Jane, there was a yeah. question earlier from Sandy, uh, quite early on in the uh, in the presentations, um, that asks, is there a tension for libraries that on one hand want to be transformational slash engaging with decolonization of the curriculum and such like, but then wanting to be at the frontier with AI? And attaching ourselves to the generation of AI biases, stereotypes, etc., from a group of people who couldn't care less about the status quo, continuing to thrive unchallenged. I know we touched a little bit about the ethics. I know Rosie mentioned it earlier as well, but um, thought that was an interesting question, really. About that. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We've seen some nodding from our panel members. Anyone want to speak to that? I, 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 my answer is yes. <laughs> there is a tension. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't agree more, but I suppose this is going to happen regardless. So I think the only way we can try and assist in resolving that tension is properly understanding AI, properly understanding the criticality uh, in relation to AI, and I, I suppose challenging that. Um, and and raising the awareness, um, but yes, I, I couldn't agree more. We're we're building. We know we're building bias and amplifying bias. But um, surely that's the biggest role we've always played in information literacy is highlighting that bias. 
Um, yeah. So almost, you know, that that's a significant role we can play in in this space. Yeah, yeah. Annalise, yeah. Yeah, and I think um, just to carry on from what you were saying, it's, it's nothing new. We're already talking about algorithmic bias and its applications and how, you know, uh, also um, what you see when you look up journals is... Uh, it's never from the global south. So we, we were already having those discussions. So I think, like you said, Rosie, does it, we need to better understand what um what biases uh those technologies um enhance and have those discussions with mm. our users and the spotting what is what what isn't there, what is, what is missing here or what what appeals to your emotions and how do you react to this? Mm, yeah, I, I see um, Adriana's made a, a, a comment about the concern of training um, Gen AI with the use of copyright materials. We've got the, the kind of various lawsuits, the one with the New York Times that's um, ongoing as well. That's definitely a big concern. Um, and you know that that how we keep ourselves well informed about that as well is something um that i think you know we're i think that kind of speaks to why so many people wanted to come to the event today you know if you put ai um on the bill then you know you're going to get a lot of people because i think people have got a bit of a sense that you know this is an area where it's changing really rapidly and that they they do need to try and, and and keep up to get date and and also to sort of maybe to try to slow things down a bit that and to kind of have that that a bit more reflection about you know be a bit careful what you wish for sort of thing you know because I think I think well, there is a bit of a, a kind of slippery slope here and and certainly the the area that concerns me the most I think is where Gen AI um you know can be used by bad actors can be used to spread misinformation um and and you know potentially uh cause real harm as well peter's asked about um whether there's a digital divide between universities if only some universities can afford licenses i mean we already potentially have a digital divide where we have wealthy universities that can do some things um we presumably have our schools, FE colleges, you know, where a lot of these tools are not going to be available. Um, I don't think... And, and it's everywhere, Jane. It's beyond that. It's in the workplace. It'll be the same thing as well. It'll be regional. Um, yeah. yeah. yeah it, I, I think that that's really concerning. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, we, we've, we've, we've got a little bit more time. So um, I've... Um, I have put together, these slides will be made available to everybody, and I've put together a couple of articles. I don't know if we want to just, I mean, in, in terms of keeping up to date, I did a really quick literature search. I did actually do a proper literature search. I did not get um, a, a Gen AI to, to hallucinate some articles, so you should be able to find these. If you just move to, yeah, so just some, uh, I mean, really interesting articles that I found um, that have come out you know in the last um year or so and I, i'm sure we're going to see many more of these um it was something um that project information literacy were looking at um in 2020 as well where they were specifically looking at algorithms um and information literacy in the age of algorithms i think you know this obviously we've got a, a big rise in interest in ai but these techno a lot of these technologies have been around um you know for some time and i think people have been speculating about this as well yeah annalise has also put in a really good explainer um that's from uh a parliament from post which i'm not sure what does the acronym stand for it's the parliamentary office for science and technology that's it yes thank you yes um but yeah i, I mean it's a good point jessica that it, you know we maybe we've lost the opportunity to lead on this maybe it's um you know if you're not on top of this tech as peter's saying and heavily involved then we're all doomed <laughs> in the words of dad's army yeah i mean it, it it certainly does feel like something um where you know there is there is it, it is a kind of key moment 
Um, anybody, so I'm going to go around each, each of my panel members um, and just do a sort of final summing up of points that you would just like to, to make. So if we go in the order that you started with, um, Josh, is there any sort of final thoughts you've got? Is is this the death of the author? What are we what are we gonna do? I think it could be, but it doesn't have to be. It's it's I I, I realise that I've come to this entire thing as a bit of an AI skeptic, and it's because I am, but I do think um there's value in making sure that just as we're sort of concerned about being left behind as a profession, I think we can take a lesson from that and make sure that the, the people that we're teaching and talking to about this, that they know what AI can do, that they know how to interact with it. And I think there is a positivity in the sense that we're well positioned to train people in what it does how to use it and so on um and i think we've got potentially a really good and positive role to play in that the one thing that i do want to kind of make a final sort of stab at going through is is we've we've kind of left the ethical implications behind and i say, I say implications i mean problems there are ethical problems that are baked into this technology in mm. terms of use of creative works um mm. Mm. often without knowledge or permission there's a whole we, if we do another session it's going to be a copyright one I think <laughs> uh, potentially so there's that there's the environmental impact there's the way that certain AI companies were putting together content filters and training data and there's a whole exploitation of labor element to this as well um, so I've seen articles arguing that there is no ethical use of AI because none of these problems they're just a part of how the technology was created and a part of how the technology works. And I think that's something that's been a bit of an elephant in the room with some of these conversations and is worth keeping in the back of our minds so that we are both ethically and technologically aware of what it is that we're doing when we're interacting with these things. Mm -hmm. um, that ends it on a bit of a downer, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, but so I, I think that's worth saying, but more generally in terms of the people that we're supporting and sort of how best we can support them, um, I think we should be doing it. I think we should be teaching it. And I think if nothing else, it does provide an opportunity for us to restate how important information literacy is and will continue to be. Thanks, Josh. Thank you. Um, we will we'll go to Annalise next. Summing up. It, it, it's hard going after Josh. Oh, that, was, that was sort <laughs> of inspirational and everything. Um, Just say we're all doomed. <laughs> just say the same same as josh now um if we we had an interesting conversation yesterday in parliament talking about misinformation and disinformation and for me it's um what's become really apparent is that it's important to stress the good uh mm. we've talked a lot about disadvantages and what can go wrong but i think several inspired me to think about what is some the good that is in artificial intelligence and I think it's really reassuring to see that there's so much interest, there are so many conversations, and we're already really aware of the bad. <laughs> so I'm going yeah. back with myself. Um, but yeah, it, it's for me, it's the power that we have as librarians and information literacy professionals to help people navigate all of this. And I think um, Sheila's prompt uh, from Gemini mm -hmm. is actually really good. Um, mm -hmm. so that, that was great. I was just going to read that out. If yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm going to rest on this. Okay. Okay. Brilliant. Yeah. No. Well, thank you, Sheila, for sharing that as well. That um, you know, overall, librarians can empower people to leverage. It's got that word in it. We said we were talking about <laughs> this yesterday. That an AI. If you find the word leverage appear, you know it's been written by an AI. But to leverage the potential of generative AI while navigating its complexities, I think. Maybe we should put that on a T-shirt, Annalise. Um, Rosie, <laughs> I'm going to come to you. Okay. Any Let, let's try, try and keep the positive tone. I, I suppose it's not just our, our positioning. We, uh, we need to remember as librarians, we work in what I think is the best profession uh, that's possible. And what we're really good at at these pivotal moments is we are really willing to share and collaborate. And you can see that already from today. Everybody is uh, saying where they're up to. They're willing to, to, to um, make sure that people are building on information. So I, you know, I, I suppose I'm going to do a rallying call that um, people continue to, to have these conversations and share the knowledge. Uh, I'm sure all of you are coming to Lilac next week. And I know that there's loads of AI sessions at Lilac next week where we can build 
uh, upon this information. And one of the articles I, I loved recently actually was in um, Jill, uh, the Journal of Information Literacy, um, where we had um, the, uh, the, the 123 librarians from Sweden who were working out almost how to find out more about AI. And I think if anyone's not seen that article, it's worth a look because the methodology for how they're having the conversation and improving their knowledge uh, is really neat. Um, ah, and I'm sure that I missed that one off the reading can, list. I should, yeah. I should post it in the chat. Yeah, please do. And I'll update these slides and add it on to them. Yeah, thank you, Rosie. Yeah, Sarah, you've got um, uh, 30 seconds. <laughs> oh, no, um, you've, got, you've got a minute or so. OK, I just want to say that echoing, you know, what Annalise said, we certainly heard at the roundtable um, parliamentary um, discussion we were at last night about malinformation and disinformation and misinformation and AI. And um, one of the things that one of the speakers there said was that, you know, we concentrate so much on the bad news because it's more interesting for people and we should really be looking to the positive. And I think this is so true in this. I kind of make an an analogy between how we deal with kind of things like the environment. It wasn't that long ago that we were all going around spotting where pollution was and reporting how terrible it was and so on. And now we've changed the narrative to how we can actually make the world a better place environmentally and all the things that have happened around that, even internationally. So we need to change the narrative about AI. I think we need to show its benefits. We need to think about the positive, not just dwell on the negative. And we do need to get it into schools so that they can understand that why it's important to be able to reflect on what you've written, to, that the process is so much more important than the output. And we know from visiting um, the Department of Education in the past that they say they can only make changes when there is a change of government. Oh, what might be happening later this year? So if we can lobby and get our MPs on side and make sure that they can drive this change within the curriculum, you know, COVID was such a brilliant opportunity to change the curriculum. Did they do it? No, they just battled away with exam, 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 instead of looking for alternatives. And I, I really feel that this has been a sea change because of that within the teaching profession. And we need to make sure that there's action as a result of that. And that's going to have great implications, really positive implications for AI and for information literacy, which is really what we're all about. So, looks like we're planning another event on uh, information literacy and the ethics and uh, and maybe some of the copyright issues associated um, with the use of some of these tools in the future. We'll see some of you hopefully um, next week at the Lilac Conference where we know there's going to be um, many sessions talking about AI as well. This is just really uh, dipping our toe in the water, but please do um, drop us a line if you've got an idea for a speaker for a follow-up session or um, are wanting to host either an online or possibly even an in-person event later in the year. Um, we're really keen with this celebration this year of 50 years of IL. I've also noted Coco's point about um, IL frameworks and whether some sort of mapping around how AI kind of fits into, you know, the, the sort of the frameworks that we've already got maybe that's a piece of work that the information literacy group could look at i love a framework i love doing some work on frameworks um i just want to thank um all of my amazing speakers um for this discussion this afternoon um i don't think we ever pretended that we had all the answers and um there's just been so much in the chat that we're going to try and get something out to everybody afterwards to make sense of it I think um, Lewis has got an, an AI on the case doing that, um, although we might have to think about the ethics of that, whether people gave their permission for their questions to be used in that way, Lewis. Uh, but thank you to Rosie, thank you to Joss, thank you to Sarah, thank you to Annalise, thank you ever so much to Padma and Lewis who were behind the scenes doing lots of tech support and ensuring this session went smoothly and you all got registered for the event. And um, yeah, really thought provoking and we're looking forward to seeing some of you next week. So, um, and, and at future events, but thank you. Thank you very much.